In late February 2024, the French President Emmanuel Macron sparked international controversy by suggesting that NATO could send combat troops to fight in Ukraine. But with Russian President Vladimir Putin suggesting that this could mark a dangerous escalation of the war and even spark a nuclear confrontation, other Western leaders have quickly distanced themselves from the idea. Nevertheless, many observers feel that it may, in fact, be a necessary step. So, could or should NATO send combat troops to Ukraine? Hello and welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is James Kerr Lindsay, and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflict, security and statehood. The war in Ukraine has emerged as one of the most significant conflicts of the 21st century. Aside from the immense human suffering that it's caused, with hundreds of thousands dead and wounded and millions displaced, it's also had a profound impact on international relations and the global political order. But questions are also growing about where it's all going. Despite a solid initial fight back, Ukraine hasn't made the decisive breakthrough that many hoped it would. This has led to fears that Moscow may in fact be gaining the upper hand and could even go on to win a decisive victory. As a result, many are asking whether we could be nearing a point when Western countries could or in fact should take a direct role in the conflict. Although the war in Ukraine started in 2014, when Russia seized control of Crimea and eastern parts of the country, the main phase of the conflict began on the 24th of February 2022, when Russian forces launched a full-scale invasion. At first, most observers expected Russian troops to make rapid progress, perhaps even overrunning the country in a matter of days. Having openly announced its intention to overthrow the Ukrainian government, the general view was that Moscow would then install a puppet regime, perhaps as a prelude to formally annexing Ukraine. However, while Russian forces initially made significant advances towards the capital, Kyiv, and seized control of large parts of the east and south of Ukraine, they soon met stiff resistance from Ukrainian forces. As a result, in the following weeks and months, the Russian advance stalled. Having beaten back the initial offensive, international assistance soon began to pour in. In addition to providing humanitarian aid, the United States, NATO and EU members, as well as other key Western states, also began to provide Ukraine with military assistance. While NATO made it clear from the very start that it wouldn't send troops to fight, a decision that many felt would lead to a dangerous escalation of the conflict, considerable amounts of ammunition, heavy weaponry and advanced equipment, such as anti-tank missiles, began to flood into Ukraine. In addition, various countries began providing intelligence support and training for Ukrainian troops. As a result, by the end of 2022, there was growing optimism that Ukraine could stop any further Russian advances and even force Russia out of the country altogether. After months of planning, Ukraine launched a huge counteroffensive in June 2023. However, despite widespread hopes that it could lead to a strategic breakthrough, Ukrainian forces struggled against heavily fortified Russian positions. While territorial gains were made in some places, the attack failed to land the necessary knockout punch. Meanwhile, international assistance for Ukraine was running into problems. As media attention shifted to a new crisis that had erupted in the Middle East, by the end of 2023, popular support for the war was declining significantly across the United States and much of the European Union. At the same time, significant political and financial difficulties emerged. Most notably, a $60 billion US aid package to Ukraine was blocked by congressional infighting. Similarly, military assistance from other countries also declined. In some cases, this resulted from growing concern about the danger of escalating the conflict by sending advanced weaponry that could strike deep into Russia. For example, Germany withheld long-range cruise missiles precisely because of these fears. In other cases, countries began to fear the implication of depleting their own arsenals to resupply Ukraine. Taken with Russia's willingness to commit vast numbers of troops to the battlefield, despite the extraordinarily high human cost, all this led to fears that Ukraine is now not only struggling to push Russian forces back, 
but it could even lose the war altogether. It was with this mounting concern about the direction of the conflict that the French government organised a high-level conference of European leaders in Paris on the 26th of February to discuss strengthening international assistance to Ukraine. While various ideas were discussed, the event came to worldwide attention with the suggestion that it might be time to consider sending in NATO combat troops. Speaking to the press after the conference, French President Emmanuel Macron told reporters that while there was no consensus on the issue, nothing could be ruled out. As expected, Moscow immediately condemned the comments in the strongest possible terms. Responding to the remarks, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman, warned that any decision to send in NATO troops could lead to a direct conflict between Russia and NATO. This was followed by a stark warning from the Russian President Vladimir Putin that it would provoke a nuclear confrontation. Meanwhile, numerous NATO members, including key alliance states, rushed to distance themselves and the organisation from the French President's remarks. For example, although the White House issued a statement reaffirming its commitment to providing military aid to Ukraine, it categorically ruled out sending troops to the country. Similarly, the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, reiterated that the European Union and NATO had a standing agreement not to deploy troops, a position that was also echoed by the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney. Even the United Kingdom, which has now been revealed, already has a small number of troops in Ukraine engaged in support roles, stated that it would avoid any large-scale military involvement, insisting it would only continue to train Ukrainian troops. But while Russia revelled in what it saw as Macron's humiliation by his NATO partners, several countries nevertheless appeared to welcome the comments. Over the following days, the French President's remarks appeared to gain at least a degree of official endorsement by Estonia, Lithuania and the Netherlands. Nevertheless, as things stand, it now seems highly doubtful that NATO will in fact send combat troops to Ukraine, either as an organisation or as individual members for the foreseeable future. But while it seems that it won't happen, there's nevertheless a debate about whether it should happen. Obviously, there are strong arguments both ways. For a start, many point to the moral responsibility to act. Russia invaded Ukraine. It violated its sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity and is waging a brutal war that's led to hundreds of thousands of deaths. And yet, by using nuclear threats to deter NATO and the European Union, it's now arguing that it's the West that would be acting recklessly by stepping in directly. Of course, while those counselling against direct intervention would acknowledge that helping Ukraine would be desirable and recognise the offensive absurdity of Russia's position, the reality is that any NATO intervention would decisively shift the war in Ukraine's favour and dramatically increase the possibility that Russia would turn to a nuclear strike, especially if Ukrainian and NATO forces seem poised to take Crimea. To this extent, it's far better to keep troops out. But while the nuclear threat is certainly worrying and shouldn't be ignored, senior military officials have argued that the counter-response is that NATO should not give in to Russian blackmail. Indeed, by having allowed Russia to use the threat of nuclear weapons from the start, NATO has effectively let Moscow set the terms of the conflict from day one and has prevented Ukraine and NATO from bringing the war to a rapid conclusion. Meanwhile, looking ahead, many would argue that the failure to act decisively now would also pose greater long-term risks. At best, it's likely to lead to tens of thousands more deaths and result in a frozen conflict where Russia effectively retains control over 20% of Ukraine and could remain poised to restart the war at a moment's notice, thus keeping Europe in a perpetual state of alert. At worst, Russia may eventually overrun an exhausted and depleted Ukrainian army and end up seizing the country altogether. If this were to happen, the broader effects would be enormous. It could well redefine international relations for the rest of the 21st century. But while it seems certain that direct NATO intervention will remain off the agenda, at least for now, many on both sides of the debate can nevertheless agree that although a lot has already been done to help Ukraine, there's still room for the Alliance to extend a lot more support. 
For a start, more assistance could be sent. In addition to finally getting the aid package through the US Congress, other NATO partners could extend their financial support. So far, the bulk of assistance has come from the United States, Germany and Britain. Meanwhile, some small countries have given proportionately far more than many larger ones. At the same time, vital weapon systems could be made available. In addition to the German cruise missiles, this includes the delivery of fighter aircraft and providing Ukraine with a range of other items, including air defence systems, helicopters and drones. Indeed, many now believe that attacks on Russian infrastructure, especially energy infrastructure and the Kerch Bridge linking Russia and Crimea, could be decisive in shifting the balance of the war in Ukraine's favour. Furthermore, while NATO might not want to send combat troops to Ukraine, its forces could cover plenty of support activities, allowing Ukrainian personnel to move to frontline roles. In addition to all this, NATO and other partners could take further political, diplomatic and economic steps. For instance, more could be done to extend the sanctions imposed on Russia and introduce new measures against those countries and companies breaking sanctions. Even now, many Western companies maintain trading links with Russia. At the same time, steps could be taken to close the backdoor routes used to supply Russia with advanced technology. But as important as all these steps would be, the stark reality is that Western leaders are facing an increasingly challenging and dangerous choice. Two years into the war, there are fears that Russia may steadily gain the upper hand, especially as it seems willing to absorb considerable losses to achieve its goals. While sending combat troops is certainly risky, many would argue that a Ukrainian defeat would represent a far more dangerous long-term development. Not only could it undermine the sanctity of European borders, it could completely upend the system of international relations that existed for almost 80 years. Indeed, it could start a new era of global power politics where military strength opens the way for territorial conquest. To this end, whether other NATO partners like it or not, many would argue that Macron has in fact opened an important, if uncomfortable, debate about the next moves in Ukraine. And in doing so, has also opened up a discussion about the future of international relations for the rest of the 21st century. I hope you found that useful. If so, here are some more videos that you might find interesting. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.